Oh, what a tune. I think we all know that tune, and we all know what that means. Today, on the Big Nose Podcast, we will be talking about the upcoming American election of the next president, or the continuing president. It will be Donald Trump or Joe Biden. This podcast is to break down the complexity that is America and the American election system. We will talk all about the candidates. We will talk about who they are, where they're from, what they did, and what they're planning on doing. We will break down the confusing system that is the Electoral College votes. And I want to talk to you about swing states and safe states. I will then tell you the three scenarios or more that might happen on the night of the election and the morning of the day after. And then for what it's worth, I will give you my own opinion on who is likely to be the winner come Tuesday or Tuesday week or whenever it gets out of the Supreme Court, if it gets that far. So without further ado, let's look at the candidates this year. We have Donald Trump. Let's have a look at what age he is. He will be 74 at the day of polling day. 74 years of age and still gone. Fair play to him. For a man who is basically a businessman, he has real estate, he has golf courses, he has been developing hotels, casinos in America and right around the world. And, you know, that's his first and foremost what we know him for. We also know him for his TV and movie personality appearances. Obviously, the front man on program The Apprentice. We had Alan Sugar or Lord Sugar as it developed into here over in Ireland and in the UK and now we have Donald Trump um, over there and now all of a sudden he's president. He obviously has starred in movies. We have seen him in Home Alone amongst others. Funnily enough has a degree in economics. Funnily enough I said. I wonder why I said that. He's a man who is known for the art of the deal. That's the book he published and that is how he has become so prominent in all of our lives. He is the son of a Scottish immigrant into America. His mother came over from Tongue, I think it was. And they were raised in, I think, New York City. He's been married three times. He was married um, and had three children with his first wife. Divorced and got married again for a few years. And in that few years, he was married for the second time. He had one child. And with his current wife and the first lady, Melania, he has married and has uh, one son, Donald Jr. No, not really Donald Jr., but you know, basically looks like him, which you would expect being the father of the child. Um, so that's Donald Trump. That's kind of a small, quick-fire bibliography or bi- biography of him. Bibliography, <laughs> biography of who he is. Now let's look at the Democratic nomination or candidate for the role of president for the next term of four years. Joe Biden, a seasoned politician, you would say. Vice President with Barack Obama, I suppose, best known for that in more recent years, uh, from 2008 to 2016. As I said, a seasoned professional uh, pro- uh, pro- professional politician. 78 this month. I think it's the 20th of November, so happy birthday, Joe Biden, for them. He was a graduate of law. He joined the Democrats in 1970, so 40, 50 years nearly on the road in public office. He was married in 1966 uh, to a beautiful woman called Nelia. They had three kids together. But unfortunately and tragically, I suppose, um, just before Christmas in 1972, uh, their family was involved in a car accident, which um, unfortunately took the lives of his wife and his daughter. Um, Joe then uh, later married in 1977. His, his wife, since then, uh, Gillian or Jill, as we well know, and they have one child together. He, as I said, he is a seasoned politician. He is senator for Delaware from 1973 to 2009, to which when he became uh, in, uh, he was at his inauguration speech or inauguration with um, Barack Obama, he became vice president, so then had to give up the seat as senator. So that's kind of a little biography of him. So that's the two candidates. That's what he aired. Trump, obviously, for the Republican Party. Joe Biden for the Democratic Party, as we know. We have Pence with Trump and we have Harris with Biden. And, and, and that's what they're standing on um, in terms of their life experience. So you would say Trump is the businessman. He has been a politician for no more than four years, realistically, a seasoned campaigner. Biden, a seasoned politician and very much uh, knowing the system that he's working in. So let's see if uh, we think he will win. Um, I suppose looking at 
their record in terms of their political career. Uh, Trump's tenure of the presidential office has been, you know, somewhat based on putting America first as he campaigned or making America great again. It was all about building the wall, I suppose, on, on the small southern front with um, Mexico. Let's be honest, that wall it hasn't been finished. It is making very much slow progress. And a lot of that has caused him to lose a lot of goodwill in the southern states. He was coming in and he wanted to eliminate federal regulation. And he has had some success in terms of the dismantling of the environmental regulations that were put in place in previous administrations. Pardon me. Um, but he did fail to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which was brought under in under Barack Obama's tenure as office in the office of president. Um, looking else, what else has he done? I suppose COVID nineteen. You can't really not mention COVID nineteen when you mention Trump. The amount of deaths that have happened while he was dealing with this pandemic will ultimately, I think, define his first four years as president of America. Whether or not he goes on to become president for another four years, I still think this will be something that basically he will be um, accompanied by. Of course, he's been impeached by the House of Representatives um, regarding a lot of investigations into how he became president, for want of a better description, without getting slanderous. Um, but he has had some success, I suppose. He has, he has had the ability to make uh, the bench or... The judges in America's courts more conservative than as recent as a couple of weeks ago in the Supreme Court and um, the latest nominee has gone in there. Um, so he has had some success. He has been very much a polarizing influence in America. He has identified his core voters and he has basically plumassed to them, as we would say in Ireland. Tell them what they want to hear, regardless of the facts or how actually it is going. Just say how he feels it is going, or just tell them how they, what they want to hear, and he and he will garner support. Looking at Biden, I suppose, and it's a comparative. He was the vice president when Barack Obama got through the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare as we know it mostly, and healthcare really has played a pivotal role in his administrations and his office throughout his fifty years almost of times. He has had personal. Uh, exposure to healthcare and what it can offer. If we look at him in terms of his record, he is very much open to conversation across the aisle, as they say in America. Very much a bi bipartisan uh, person. He has harnessed his experience to be able to speak to anybody and everybody. And I suppose that was no more prominent when he was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He is very much about having conversations, using diplomacy across America and across the world in terms of putting America in a position of power and he won't step away from it so in that 50 years he's built up a, a reputation for being a pe person of the people he is very much able to have difficult conversations but also bring along people with him that's the two candidates and that's what they're fighting for and on the basis of what they're fighting for and in and obviously they're not working within a vacuum but I suppose in terms of how you become president that's the difficulty. First and foremost, obviously you need to have a party. Now, I know people will be shouting at this and saying, oh, there's independence, and I'm sure there is independence, but none of them have ever become or have ever come close realistically to become president of America. So first and foremost, you need to either be the incumbent, as in the situation with Donald Trump, and then you have to either then be elected from the opposition's party in terms of getting the nomination from that party and that can be a long pro practice um, um, state and as we've seen with the democrats in the last maybe year in terms of pouring the amount of people that they put forward the amount of people that stood up and wanted to become their nomination so to become the president it is a very easy on paper system what you need to do is to win 270 or more of the electoral college votes now, what the hell you're screaming at the at the radio or at your earphones or at me? What are electoral college votes? Well, basically there are 538 electors or people who represent each state who basically vote on behalf of the people in their state. So how do you come up with the number 538? Well, doing a bit of research, I'm breaking it down into this. So each state has represent, re representatives. 
these representatives are based on the population of each state. So depending on how many people you have, you get that many, a proportion of that is represented in the House of Representatives. So there's 435 representatives in the House of Representatives which represent the population of America, which is broken down into different states. So depending on the population in your state, you'll have more or less representatives. For example, in California, a heavily populated state, there are 55, I believe, electoral votes. Each state in America gets two senators. 50 states, that's 100 senators, that's 100 more electoral voters. And finally, you have three elector, electors from the D District of Columbia. Adding them all up on the back of an envelope, you get 538. So, if you get 270 or more, you become the President of the United States of America. You may get more than 50% of the popular vote, that's all the votes uh, combined together across the 50 states of America, and still not become President. This has happened as recent as the last two Presidents of America who have happened to be Republicans. So, Donald Trump in 2016 beat Hillary Clinton when he got less, less than she did in the popular vote. And as we all remember, Al Gore got the popular vote in 2004, actually, wasn't it? 2004, God almighty. 2004, and he still lost to George W. Bush. And we remember how close that was because that went on for a while. I think it was a week after we were all talking about Florida and the importance of Florida. So that's it in simple terms. So you're looking at me and saying, okay, then how did you come up with 538 electors? That's how you came up with it. How long has this been in place? This has been in place since 1964. How did they come up with that number? Okay, so basically they come up with that number through populations. They break the population down in each state and that's how many representatives you get. And it's that simple. So in terms of how that represents in terms of becoming president, obviously you want to win the states that have the higher level of electoral votes. Correct. But some states are more important than others. So for example, California has 55. So everybody wants to win that. But for a lot of people, California is going to be a safe state. California generally is more um, open, expansive, liberal, and generally votes democratic. And the same with New York. So what you'll find is then that we will be focusing on safe states and swing states. Now, before we get on to what safe states are and swing states are, it's one more important thing to point out that to make it simple for a lot of people who might not be familiar with the electoral college vote system, I look at it like this. For example, in California again, there might be 50 people. So there's 50 votes, 50 million votes up for grabs. If you win that state by one vote, you get in your kitty the 55 electoral votes. Basically, it's an adding up process. If you can add up states or win states with the most electoral votes and then add them all up, you will win the election. So you have to win basically mini elections within the larger election. And that's all you have to do. So you need to be strategic. You need to be aware of where the votes are, where you can and where you can't win. And this is where it comes into the phrase and we'll move on to it now what swing states are and safe states are. So safe states are states that are known to vote the same way year on year, election on election. They have had senators from the Republican Party for years. They've had representatives from the Republican Party for years. They have had red, red, red for year after year after year after year. And they are not likely to change anytime soon. So why would you bother as a as a campaigner going to that state one if you are a Republican or two if you're a Democrat if you know a state's not going to go the way you want it to go what's the point of investing money time and energy that can be best spent in other states where there's more likely to be a sway or a swing the same way you wouldn't go to a state if you were a Democrat and you were likely to win that state so New York California are very li less likely to get visits from challengers or the president when they know the state is going to be 
the way it goes. So that's what safe states are. States that candidates or presidents don't go to because they know what way they're likely to vote and they've always voted Democrat or they've always voted Republican. And there's no need to waste time, waste money that can be best channeled into areas where there is likely to be a swing or there's votes up for grabs. And this brings us on to the crux of what swing states are. Swing states change year on year or election on election for a number of reasons. The population may have changed, so therefore the number of electors that they get has changed. This year you would be forgiven for thinking that there is more than normal in terms of swing states, but that's as a representative of how close this actual race is. There is about, I would say, between 9 and 10 states of the 50 states of America that are up for grabs between Trump and Biden. I would say the following is the list of states. You are looking at Wisconsin, Texas, Georgia, Michigan, Arizona, Florida, as always, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Nebraska, and North Carolina. If you look at the news in the coming days up to the election, you will see these candidates and the president going to these states over and over again. For example, last night, I believe Trump did, I think, four or five visits in Pennsylvania alone and more and more campaigning in Pennsylvania alone than any other state so far. If you look at Florida, for example, with 29 college votes in Previous elections, I think it was the last election between Clinton and Trump. Trump and Clinton, between the two of them, visited parts of Florida 35 and 36 times respectively. Whereas they may not have gone to the likes of Alaska, for example, more than twice, if at all. So this is why I want to break down the swing states. So I mentioned Florida, Arizona, Michigan, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Texas, Georgia, Ohio, Wisconsin, and North Carolina. If we take all of their electoral votes, it adds up to 178 electoral votes. So if you remember, I said you need 270 electoral votes to become president. So if you win those, what is it, two, four, six, eight, ten states, you are 66% of the way to getting that 270, even though it's only 20%. Of the states of America and this is the key to the electoral sorry 178 seats available and you're looking at Florida which is 29 you're looking at Texas which is 38 and that's nearly the guts of what is it 29 38 67 seat, seats so that's even with those two states out of those 10 states is a third of the seats available so you're looking at you know possibly having a campaign across 50 states or two states play into it and that's a little bit interesting because when we come to my predictions there is a very interesting point I'll make on it. Why would you bother then going to a safe state if you can go to Texas what might be leaning left or right or blue or red or Biden or Trump when you have to focus on the possibility of getting 38 which will ultimately bring you across the line when it comes to the end of it. So that's what swing states are. They're neither red or blue Democrat or Republican, they go depending on the issue. Now, I'm not going to break down each state. I'm not going to look at each state because we could be here till kingdom come. But we all remember what happened between Al Gore and uh, George W. Bush back in 2004, as I just about remembered. That was so close that it actually went on for a bit of time. 29 seats is a lot of seats. It's, it's just just over 10% of the seats needed so one state representing just over 10% of what you need that's that's a huge that's a no-brainer that's why you fight for that Texas again so if you look at Texas California you look Texas California and Florida and you add them all up 55 29 and 38 you have the guts of 110 that's serious that is serious seats and then you add in the ones that you already have safe or you're pretty sure that will go your way like you're on to serious, serious numbers. Okay, it might be three states out of 50, but this is how it works. And, you you know, there has been a number of conversations over the years in terms of trying to change this, but it, it just hasn't come to fruition, and I don't think it will come to fruition for the next few years. And that's how you become president of America. 
pretty simple. You get it nominated by your party or you're the incumbent. You get 270 of the 538 electoral seats and bingo, you're in the Oval Office. Obviously, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Campaigning, debates, which obviously this year in the COVID-19 situation have been very difficult to have, let's be honest. Campaigning has been very different. Joe Biden has gone around and hasn't had too many people at his rallies. Trump has continued with the old-fashioned having the doorsteps and having the barnyard and having the big old events with people, loads of people in attendance. Um, he's been, you know, he's been he's been singing to the converted, I suppose, in that sense. In sense of what will happen on the night of the third or the morning of the fourth, traditionally in Ireland, we'll wake up about 7 a.m., 5 p.m., oh, sorry, 5 a.m. in East Coast time in America. And at that stage, we normally will have a result. So looking at this election and looking at all the rhetoric that has gone around and what's been spoken about in the last number of weeks and months in terms of the legitimacy of certain procedures and ways of voting. Voting has been open for, at this stage, a couple of months in some states where you can actually go and in-person vote, as they call it, in some states. Um, you have the ability to vote by post up to the third and as long as the stamp on the envelope in which you return your vote has the third on it it will be accepted and it can take up for a week for that post to be processed and in terms of receiving it putting it in the postal office sending it to the sort center getting the sort center correct and then getting it opened and actually piling it up and putting it in the right area so you're looking at a possibility in the covid time when people aren't trying to get out as much that we could have a delay in declaring, which obviously in an economy, in, from an economic point of view, is uncertain. And uncertainty can ne negatively affect an economy. And America's economy is very susceptible to the negative impacts such as this. So but they will be conscious on, on the night of the third and the morning of the fourth that this won't happen. The one and the first scenario would be that Trump is a clear winner, that he gets over the 270 by a large margin. He might be get onwards for 290, 300. And the votes have been coming in and there's been a trend and there's been an acceptance by the Democrats that maybe they haven't done enough, which, you know, looking at the way they've campaigned, there is a possibility that they haven't done as much as they probably should have done. And the approach to campaigning has been, while in line with public and, and public and health recommendations, might not be how they get across the line and they might look back at this and say, OK, we did it wrong. Um, but there's a clear first in the first scenario there's a clear win for Trump. Trump will obviously jump on that fairly quickly. He will tr call call it out fairly early on. You know he, he will use phrases like it's been a great night, uh, uh, and and that uh, he called it obviously because he knew all along that he was going to win quite clearly. In scenario two, you're looking at a possibility of a clear Biden win, and I think. People have suggested, regardless of whether Biden wins by a little bit or a lot, Trump will still argue it. But I think if we get into the scenario where the votes are coming in from the East Coast early doors and the South is also going blue or going Biden, there has to be an acceptance amongst the Republican Party as a whole and then obviously as the candidate that this isn't going the way that they were hoping for it to go and that it might be a case for the best will in the world, with the best will in the world and as sad as it might be for the Republican Party that they haven't done enough. The mood has changed in the country and that they want the democratic leadership. As long as it's clear, and I'm saying the 300 mark is quite important to make it as clear as possible because, as I said, the electoral system, you know, at one, one place one place going your way and are not going your way for the sake of 38 electoral votes in Texas, which at the moment is looking like a swing state, is actually if you if you actually double it is is how it will, will will affect it because if you're all of a sudden on 300 and you're you have uh, Texas in that 300 if you remove Texas all of a sudden you're on 260 and your opponent is on 260 so you know it's important to look at it from that point of view and then the third and probably the most difficult and most worrying scenario I would say is a dead heat where there's no clear winner. And probably this is what will come to fruition, that there is no clear winner. Um, things are too tight to call in each state on a first level. So you can't actually call the electoral votes. And then secondly, on a national level, 
when the electoral votes are all added up that it's too close so therefore you get into a protracted um, situation where the incumbent will have to stay in office for reasons of national security for continuation of stability within the economy and for national that national unrest because let's be honest guys america is in a situation where there's a lot of upheaval in society there's the pandemic there's the black lives matter movement there's a lot of social unrest and any more instability within that environment will only um, will only cause further uh, negativity to occur and i think for that to happen we will be looking at a, a scenario where we could be ending up in court. We could have an Al Gore, George Bush system uh, scenario where, where where we don't have an answer for a number of days, if not weeks. And that will be very, very unfortunate. Now, I'm looking into my crystal ball. And I have been doing a little bit of research and I've been looking at different states. I am calling it a win for Joe Biden. And a significant win with upwards of 300 plus between 300 and 320 seat, uh, electoral vote seats, electoral votes. I think he will get 307, if I'm being actually precise about it. Um, I think he will win Florida, and I think he'll win Pennsylvania. And I think those two states are will be the ones that are key to watch in this election. I hope that if he was to win, that it was a, a clear and free transfer of power, let's say, and that Trump accepts the defeat and moves on. I am hoping for a clear win, whether it's for Trump or whether for Biden. Clarity is very important, not just for America, but for the world and the wider, because at the moment there's enough going on without any additional instability. So that's it, guys. That's my look at the American election, upcoming election on November 3rd. I wish both candidates the very best of luck. I hope I've explained their electoral system as clear as I can. I hope I've made it as simple and understandable as possible. I am appreciative of the fact that it is a convoluted way to get a president. If it was a one case, a case of one vote per person and the person with the most votes wins, I think we all accept that would be a better way. But it's not the way. And, you know, America will do as America wants, as we all know. Thanks for listening. Find me on all the normal platforms in terms of this podcast. Follow me on Instagram, the Big Nose Podcaster. And I look forward to having you back here next week with a new episode of the Big Nose. Thanks for listening. Take care. Goodbye.